Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Take it away. <laughs> Bless you. And thank you all so much for having me. So, like you said, my name is Kayla Nagel. I manage the Open Educational Resource Program with the Michelson 20 Million Minds Foundation. Um, I did want to take a second at the beginning and just let our good friends in the room know, we have an extra photographer here today. If you are not chill with having your photo taken, the back row is set up for you. So if you're in the back row, you won't have any photos taken. If you're not, then um, let's get famous. I don't know. It's, it'll just be on our website. Um, so one of the other things I want to do is, Franz, could you help me out real quick? Could you hand out that worksheet that's at the beginning or get it started passing around? Mm -hmm. that is my that's the campaign planning worksheet that we're going to be talking through. There's also a PDF of this available online. Um, so this is something that you can also go back to no matter what your campaign is and reference it over and over again when you're designing what you are working on. Um, so I'm gonna get started and Let's see, there we go. What, why aren't you? There we go, okay. So a little bit longer form introduction. So the Michelson 20 Million Minds Foundation works primarily on issues that relate to making sure higher education is accessible to as many people as possible. We actually got started working on textbooks over 10 years ago when our founder, Dr. Michelson, was interacting with students in the California Community College system who could not afford their books. And it seemed ridiculous to him that students were being kept out of actually fulfilling what they were going to college for because they couldn't afford their materials. So he ended up providing one of the, um, some of the original funding to, to start OpenStax, which became one of the largest open textbook publishers in the game. Um, they're still out there creating really high quality textbooks that I would be surprised if you have had a class that's used one, that would not surprise me at all. Um, but to introduce myself, uh, like I said, my name is Kaylin Nagel. I use they, them, or she, her pronouns. Um, I have been working in textbook affordability and with students for over, for over seven years. Um, I am new in this position, so I'm very excited to be here with you all today. But I got started as a community organizer working on campuses here in Southern California, helping students work on issues ranging from textbook affordability, of course, but also getting the UC campuses to commit to 100% renewable electricity, um, working on issues like fighting hunger and homelessness on college campuses, and running voter registration campaigns that helped register thousands of students to vote. Um, I've been working specifically on textbook affordability for the past four years, where I was the US PERG and student PERG uh, textbook affordability campaign director nationally and I was able to just join on with the Michelson Foundation this past August and I am thrilled to be able to continue working in this space. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about. We are going to be talking about campaign planning but we are going to be doing that through the lens and frame of textbook affordability. So I'm going to take a second at the beginning and kind of outline some of the reasons why textbooks are so inexpensive and what some of the possible solutions are, because um, I think that will set us up for more success later. Um, and then we're gonna talk about goals, your strategies, tactics, and then dive into two separate case studies um, where students were effectively able to leverage student power to either win a campaign or make significant progress on one, um, because students can win, and I've seen them do it over and over again, which is why I keep doing this. If we couldn't win, I think I'd stop. Um, okay, so, Let's start out talking about why the textbook market is broken. Three companies control 80% of the textbook marketplace. Three companies. And the market of textbooks doesn't work the same way that a lot of other consumer products do. It is a broken market because you are all captured. You're something called a captured market. Now, if you were buying shoes, right, you could say, well, I like this brand style but you know the arch support in that one is a little bit better and the price point's really what I'm looking at, so I'm gonna actually go with that one. With textbooks, you don't have that option. You have to buy what is assigned to you. And so the rules of supply and demand just don't work. 
Um, and because of that, and because of the near monopoly that we're seeing in the textbook marketplace itself, textbook costs increased at three times the rate of inflation from the 1970s all the way up until like 2016, and then they flatlined. Now, just because it's evened off doesn't mean that they're suddenly affordable, right? Um, so one of the things, and one of the reasons why it has flatlined is not because you know these three publishers were really nice and decided to just not charge so much anymore. Um, part of it is because students, faculty, and systems really started doing excellent work on implementing open educational resources, on setting up textbook exchange networks, on expanding access to textbooks in multiple ways, and students are incredibly creative at finding really good deals. Um, for example, how many of y'all have shared, and if you're in the chat, I encourage you to put this in the chat box, um, how many of y'all have shared a textbook with a friend to save money? Yeah, I'm seeing five people, great. Have any of y'all used like the library copies of a textbook? I know that's been much harder during COVID, but oftentimes, ooh, when the world is normal again, um, your campus library will often have copies of the textbook there for you to rent out for a certain set of period of time. Saves a lot of money. Um, how many of y'all have found a better deal online, maybe in a Facebook group or, yeah, uh, or maybe like an online retailer? And then don't raise your hand with this one, but I'm sure that some of y'all might have been able to find some copies of books online in other ways. Um, but the truth is that students have always been really good at figuring out how to make things affordable even when the system works against you. And the textbook publishers know that y'all do that. So what they've been doing over the past 20 years is finding out ways to shut down those extra markets, right? So for example, if you have a textbook that is only accessible with an online password, you can't share that with your friend. You can't go to the library to get a copy of that. You can't resell that at the end of the term and recoup some of that cost, right? But despite the fact that access codes started limiting the ability for students to find those affordable options, we know that 20% of students still don't buy an access code because they can't afford it. Have any of y'all ever not bought an access code because it was just too much? Maybe you did that very sad math where you were like, okay, if I get an A on everything else, I can still get a B in this course if I don't do any of my homework. I see some nods. That's sad, you shouldn't have to do that. So textbook publishers have gotten really smart. What's the best way to make sure that you still have to buy their product even if you find a way around it? Well, you, you, they just put it on your student account. They don't ask you if you wanna buy it or not. So we started seeing these new programs I call them automatic textbook billing, but in other places they call it inclusive access or first day access, or my favorite one that just makes my blood boil, uh, equitable access, where they just automatically charge students for the cost of materials. Um, now, this does, in theory, get you a better price than you would if you were to buy it brand new on the internet or something like that, but I cannot think of a single other consumer product where two people get into a room Decide how much you are going to pay for something, and then you have to figure out how not to pay for that thing. That's just a consumer protection nightmare. So that's another emerging problem we're seeing. In addition to that, as more and more materials move online, students who do not have reliable access to the internet do not have consistent access to those materials. So the digital divide is keeping students from being able to participate in classes. and. These digital materials are forcing students to pay to participate in classes you've already paid tuition for. That seems like a problem to me. And then behind all of this, right, behind all these digital materials, behind uh, affordability, there's also the fact that your homework is spying on you. When you have an access code, when you have online homework, they are siphoning off huge amounts of student data and they're storing it and they are aggregating it on the back end, and there's very little agency that students have on controlling what happens there. And just a couple years ago, Pearson, one of those three big textbook publishers, had a leak where thousands of students' names, email, and personal information was put out onto the web. 
those students had to give Pearson their information in order to pass their classes. So this is an emerging problem. So that was a lot of doom and gloom. Let's get on to some good news. The truth is, though, we don't have to tolerate this broken textbook marketplace. And students and educators and people who work with in, within colleges have been actively trying to fix this for years and been doing some really great work. The one that I'm most excited about are open textbooks, which is my preferred thing to call them, although open educational resources is the umbrella term for that. And these are educational materials written and released under an open copyright license, which means they are free to read online. They cost pretty much the paper and ink they're printed on to get a print copy. Um, faculty can adopt and adapt them and make a perfect textbook for their class. If you went to the last one on textbook affordability, um, it really laid all of this out very well. But it also means that if you download this book, you have access to it online or offline. So you can read your textbook on your way to work on the bus, or if your sibling has to take a test at the same time as you and only one of you can get good internet at once. Um, so it, it is just more flexible and it does there is just no better way to remove a cost barrier than making something free. Um, and then in addition to that, California has been a leader in OER for years. Back in 2016, the state invested a few million dollars in open textbooks. Not a whole lot, but with that, they were able to create, um, they were able to create degree pathways where students could go through their entire way to getting a degree and not have to pay anything for textbooks. Students saved $42 million in just three years through this program. And not only did they save that money, but it increased their grade point average. All students felt that bump. Across the board, there's about a 3.1% bump in the grade point average. But if you were a Pell Grant recipient, that number was 7.6. So while all students benefit, students that come from economically vulnerable places often benefit a whole lot more which makes sense to me because you've completely removed that cost barrier. So this is the context we're going to be moving on to the next things in. Okay. When we are talking about goals, I want to start a little bit even bigger than what's on this screen. Before you start narrowing in on what you want to work on, I encourage you to think of the vision for the world that you want to live in. Now this can be narrow, and what I mean by this is if you are working on something environmental, your goal is not to create a community garden. Your goal is to create a society where you can wake up in the morning and not have to check the quality of the air to know if you can take a jog. To know that your children are gonna still live in a place where there are ice caps. That you're not gonna have to move every three years because of a forest fire. That you can reliably get to where you need to go using public transit. That is a visionary view of the world. When we talk about textbook affordability, the thing that motivates me is the idea that education could be a continual process throughout our lives and not just something where they rubber stamp you on the forehead and say, go out and join the workforce. Where you can continue accessing these materials forever. Where my mom, who lives in rural Appalachia, is able to brush up on French using an open textbook before she goes to Europe for the first time where a student can reliably know that they can have their materials forever and go back and refer to them, where knowledge is created collaboratively rather than it for solely a profit motive. That is the vision of the world I want, is a vision of a rich intellectual commons. But when we're talking about goals, we should really be talking about these things. So first, um, I want to give you all a quote from Fred Ross Sr. He is a famous organizer. I'm going to talk about him a lot because um, I basically have tattoo I basically like have tattooed onto my forehead axioms for organizers. But to inspire hope, you need to have hope yourself. Um, now, in order to inspire hope though, you got to make sure that this stuff is measurable. So when you are setting a goal, it needs to be specific as in narrow. You have to know exactly what it is you want to do. It should be measurable as in you should know when you have done the thing or not. Sometimes that's a yes checkbox, sometimes that's a percentage or a number. It should be achievable as in you know that this is something you can actually do. So for example, it may not be achievable to get 100% OERs on your campus because you're always going to have to buy a copy of Catcher in the Rye at some point. And that is not yet in the public domain. Um, it should be relevant. This is something I, you know, if your goal, for example, environmentally, 
is to get your campus to commit to 100% renewables. Recycling is really cool and important, but it's not actually relevant to your 100% renewables goal. It might be worth doing, but it's not actually part of your SMART goal, and you should think critically before spending resources on something that doesn't get you to your end. So that's an example to like think about. And it should also be timely. You should have a time limit. Now, that's that way you can plan. If you don't have a time limit, you don't have an ability to plan backwards from it. So here's something that I would like to load into a cannon and then fire directly into the sun. And that is the phrase raising awareness. Raising awareness is the opposite of a SMART goal. It's not specific. What is the awareness? When do you know it has been raised? Can you win the raising of the awareness? No. But, and it also doesn't change the material conditions that people are living through. So I always encourage people to think critically before they want to raise awareness. Now you can educate, and you can set goals around education. You can say, I want 45% of faculty to know what an open educational resource is by two years from now, and you can survey faculty and figure that out. But if it's just, we're gonna raise awareness around this, I believe you can do better. So here are three examples of a SMART goal. We're actually gonna be working uh, and creating a plan for that middle one. So textbook costs added to the course registration page of Glendale City College by spring 2023, including ZTC markers. So that way, when you're registering for classes, you know how much those textbook costs. And um, if a class is zero textbook cost, there's a marker there so that way you can find it. So if you are in the chat, or if you are in the room, uh, would you say that this, uh, this middle one is specific? And what is specific about it? Raise your hand or yell at me, I don't care. Or in the chat, you can type it. Yeah, exactly, it's at a specific location, and it's what you wanna do for that specific college, right. Is this measurable? Is there a way for you to know? Is, is this like a thing that can be measured? What's measurable about it? Yeah. So you can. So I'm repeating y'all so that we are friends online can hear. But uh, right, no, yeah. <laughs> so you can go online and you can see whether or not it has happened. So this is a yes, it can be done. Yes, it can't be done. Exactly. Um, I think this is achievable, so we're gonna skip over that for time's sake. And is this timely? Would y'all say, is there a time limit on here? This one's an easy one. What's the time limit? Spring 2023, great, I gave that one away. Okay, so let's talk about strategy. Strategy is your theory for how you are going to win. How will we get to that goal of course marking by 2023? Um, well, you're going to need to convince some people, so let's start there. Um, now, here's another quote from Fred Ross Sr. It's not the way, it's the way that people are that matters, not the way you'd like them to be. And this is one of the most important things when it comes to organizing, and I think it's really important to keep that in mind, no matter what issue you're working on. It doesn't matter what you want when you start out. It matters what actually is out there when you're making your plan. And then you can move people to where you want them to be or where you need them to be. So you need to know some who's and some how's and some what's though to develop this strategy. So this is a little rubric that I find very helpful when I'm doing this. I think that there are four main buckets of campaigns. A hero campaign, so this is when the public at large or your community agrees with you and your decision maker, so that person that ultimately will like pull the lever and make the thing happen, also broadly agrees with you. They may not have done it yet, they may not have prioritized it. Somebody might be standing in their way, but they broadly are like, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, a cover strategy, this is when either the public is against this, or very often a vocal segment of the public is against this. But the decision maker is ultimately with you. So I like to actually use, um, I like to actually use gun control regulation when we talk about cover campaigns, because if we take a specific issue like uh, background checks for gun owners, that is about a 60% support rate among the general public. Um, but it's very hard for legislators to make movement on that issue because a very 
very loud and active segment of their community will push back. And so you have to provide political cover for the elected official or other decision maker to make progress on that. So that you can say, I know, I know, I know, but these guys over here won't leave me alone. You wanna be the guys that won't leave them alone. The one that they can use as an excuse. Um, a pressure campaign, this is when the public is with you, but the decision maker does not agree with you. Um, this is often the more aggressive form of campaigning. Um, this is the ones where, like the chancellor was talking about uh, this morning when she talked about busting into the president's office. That was a pressure campaign. Um, and that was using very pressure style tactics. And then the last one is where the public doesn't agree with you and the decision maker doesn't agree with you, my advice to you would be to choose a different campaign um, because you have limited time and resources. But this is where you might wanna run something of an educational campaign and set goals around that. This would be a very long-term strategy. And I'm currently working on some education-based campaigns, um, but if you have a limited time span that you are gonna be working on your campus, you either need to make sure there are people there set up once you're gone to continue that forward if you want it to succeed, or you might wanna think of a way to focus in on some other area that, of that overall vision that you care about. So that's like some general advice there. So on the other side though, you have the decision maker. So this is the person that ultimately pulls that lever, and you wanna know some things about them. Now you don't wanna get pulled into a rabbit hole. I recommend only spending a single day on research of your decision maker, or else you end up getting way too overwhelmed, and it's actually not that helpful. You can usually find out everything you need to know about someone um, within two hours. Um, so you want to figure out what ultimately matters to them. What are their backgrounds and their motivations? Are they movable? Why are they movable? If not, is there someone around them who is movable? Um, so figure out who the decision maker is and then figure out what it is they care about and what they do. And then after that, you should schedule a meeting with them right away um, to just ask them to do the thing. Because sometimes they surprise you and say yes and you don't have to run a campaign. That's always the best. So always ask them first, because sometimes you'll be surprised. Okay, so we're gonna talk about power mapping. That's me. I'm not a dean of technology, but we're gonna pretend I am for this. Um, on that form, that I handed out and on this slide here, which I'm gonna be flipping back and forth from, we are going to uh, power map me. So we're gonna pretend that I am the Dean of Technology at Glendale Community College. It's my closest community college, um, so I thought I'd use that example. They seem really cool, I've been onto their website, thought about taking a couple classes there actually. Um, so this is some information about me, this is all true. So what we're gonna do is pretend that I'm the Dean of Technology at this school, and I want you all to use this amount of information, which is stuff you could find out if I had a Wikipedia page, if I had a website, a bio on the website. Um, you could find this out by checking out my social media. Um, some of this stuff is professional, some of it is um, personal, and some of it I'm gonna encourage you to draw inferences about. So let's start at the top. What are some of the, the main, th so we're gonna think about like, how would you influence me? So some things to know about me, I went to University of Georgia, got my degree in anthropology and archeology. span When I was a student, I volunteered on feminist economic jo justice causes, and I was really interested in student journalism. I have worked for Meals on Wheels, raised money for the American Red Cross, worked on anti-war issues, worked for a consumer protection group. I'm on the record as supportive of open textbooks, and I am skeptical of education technology. I've been on my job for three years, I'm relatively young, and you can tell that I've been very visible. If there is an opportunity for me to be seen doing good work, you will see me. Um, I, from social media, if you do some light stalking, you can see that I live in Northeast Los Angeles. I volunteer on local elections in my not so much free time. I irregularly attend St. Bernard Parish. I have a community guard member, I go to LGBTQ events, and I post a lot of history and archeology span memes. Um, which is factual, by the way. You can follow me on Twitter to get some occasionally. Um, so, what is some information here that y'all could use? So first, would you say that I, I, I'm the decision maker here, would you say, what kind of campaign should you run? So let's back up. Which one of these do you think that I fit into? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, so your theory is that because the textbook industry is quite large and powerful, that you might have to run a cover strategy because you know that I'm generally gonna agree, but uh, the reason I might not agree is because I might be influenced by the textbook industry or worry that they're gonna put influence on me. That's a really good theory. Um, what does someone else think? I, I would actually run a hero strategy here. That would be my, because my, the textbook industry is powerful, right? But the, their power is pretty limited to like writing annoying letters to the editor every once in a while and subtweeting. Um, they're also really good at lobbying. But, you know, I'm not an elected official. So, uh, but I am on your campus. I'm pretty accessible. Um, do, do you all think that the student body would be broadly, who do you think I mostly answer to? Like, who do you think is my boss here primarily? If I'm the dean of technology. Yeah, an administrator probably. Who do you think I care about a lot? Like, what, who do you think is like the demographic I care the most about? Students. Yeah, students, absolutely. Um, and like, do you think that I would need political cover from either of those groups to run this campaign? I'm not roasting you, I'm just, no. yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is a real question. Do you think that like, do you think students would broadly agree with this goal of course marking? Yes. Yeah, I think so, I hope so. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about it, so I really hope so. Um, and like, do you think administrators would be like broadly against it? No, I mean they might be annoyed. It is a lot of work. They may have like competing resources, but they wouldn't be like, that's a bad idea, we're definitely not doing that. They're also legally required to do a lot of it and just like haven't gotten around to it. Um, so yeah, I would want to hear, do, do y'all, so let's take a vote, hero versus cover. So uh, let's do, do, do you want to amend your? Yeah, you can strike cover. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going with hero officially, okay. Um, all right, and so what are some things that I am motivated by? What do you think I care about? Justice. Yeah, justice, what kind of justice do you think I care about? Economic justice, there's no reason to think that I like graduated and all my values have gone out the window. Equality, yeah, I definitely, I would, I would say that it is pretty good to th think about equality. Um, what do you think, what do you think about personally, like professionally? What do you think, do you think I'm fixing to retire? No, no, no. Do, you, what do you, what do you think is my next step in life? Yeah, I might be trying to go up the ladder, right? I might be trying to build a career, I'm 30, right? Lord knows I'm not retiring until I'm 90. Ice caps are gonna melt first. But, so here's the thing, like I'm an upwardly mobile young professional who cares a lot about this field. What makes you think that I, I wanna get, I wanna move up? Yeah, most people wanna move up. Yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. What's another clue? You, you raised your hand. I'm honestly really good with accessibility. Yeah. Um, it interests me not only, and I'm a little bit, yeah, like, visibility, social media platforms. Mm-hmm. So we're, because I'm visible is what you're saying, it's a pretty good indication that I'm putting myself out there for a promotion. Yeah, yeah I would agree with that. That's why I put it on there. I was trying to leave some breadcrumbs. Um, if someone's really old though, like let's say I am 65, I've been working at this college for 35 years, I have established record of doing good things for students, everything else is pretty much the same, what would my motivator there be? Yeah, uh, over there. Legacy. Yeah, legacy, absolutely. I want to get the library named after me. Um, I want people when they when they see my picture in the hall, I'd be like, yeah, that was a that was a good person. I'm I'm so glad I got to work with them. So uh, take a minute, look at what these people have next, because it, it might it'll influence your campaign and it'll influence the types of tactics that you use. Um, okay, uh, who do you think influences me? Like on your campus community, on Glendale Community College, because we're all now Glendale Community College student senate members. Um, and I would love if someone was from Glendale Community College in the chat, that would be awesome. Um, but 
on that campus, who do you think that I would care a lot about based on this information? Students broadly, but let's, let's narrow it down. Yeah. Yeah, probably underprivileged students, students from historically marginalized backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah, so I probably care a lot about women and LGBTQI plus community members. Absolutely. The what? I don't know what that is. Yeah, so disabled students. I, I didn't put it on here, but I actually have multiple learning disabilities. So it's something that I always pay a lot of attention to. I have dyslexia, and I could not read for a lot of elementary school. So yeah, it's something I care a lot about, especially when it comes to education technology, because that's not always easy for us. Yeah, over there. Um, the yeah, absolutely. I would definitely care about basic needs students. Also, here is uh, an easy one. I probably just care a lot about what the anthropology department thinks. Like, I know that when, I know, for example, the chancellor of UCLA, Gene Block, he still teaches classes for the biology department. He still teaches, like, weird classes on shellfish every other year. Like, once you become an administrator, doesn't mean you stop caring about the academics themselves. Okay, so you have some information about me. Uh, what you want to do then is I encourage you to draw three concentric circles. I, if you have the PDF, or pulled that up or found it or have it in front of you, I did that for you already. Um, but I believe in you, you can draw three circles. Um, at the center of the circle, you should use this as your brainstorm. Um, the center is the people that are the closest to your decision maker. Out from there is the next rung of, uh, is the next rung of influence, and then out there is the people with the least amount of influence. So you, if you, for example, happen to have a friend of mine, happen to know one of my friends, right? Let's say that uh, you, we both know someone who is a member of the LGBTQ community in Northeast Los Angeles, and we just have a friend in common. The first person you should go to is that friend to be like, hey, what's the deal? What's the deal with Kaylin? Why hasn't she done this yet? Do you think you could talk to her about it? Why not? but also immediate colleagues, things like that. The next one will be like that next line of influence, right? Um, this is the, the second most important. These are some really important people. This could be the academic senate, the faculty union, the y'all are probably in this next line, this next uh, circle very often if you're talking about like top admin on your campus. Um, and then outside would be individual students or like the student body as a whole, because that's not really, you know, an individual or like, individual faculty or student groups like like I, I might not care too much about what the anime club thinks about uh, about course marking but if you got the anime club and the future business leaders of America and um, the biochemistry club and the acapella groups to all sign a letter that means something so once you have this filled out with your big brainstorm, and you should put everyone you can think of on this list when you're doing this for your, your target, right? Then you should think about who do you have access to? Who could you get access to? You might not have access to the people in that center circle, but that's okay if you can underline a couple of these people on the outside. Maybe you can get a faculty senate resolution passed, right? Uh, maybe you can get a sign on from like 10 different student groups. Maybe you can get something uh, passed in the campus paper. So it's, you wanna like underline who you have access to and you may not use all those points of access, but these are the communities you will be organizing to influence that decision maker. These are the people you will be moving and leveraging. Okay, can I get a time check? How much time do we have? Okay, well, how much, when is it? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So tactics are the things you do. So these are the things that you actually do to move those communities. Um, and when you do this, you need to take some time and figure out what your resources are. You will not be able to do all the things, right? But your resources are time, money, and access. Uh, and then your tactics should flow from the strategy. 
if your strategy is a hero strategy, which is what it is for me, the Dina technology, I, I agree with you, the community agrees with you, we just gotta make this thing happen. You wanna make sure the things that you are doing fit within a hero strategy, and you should develop a strategy statement. So for example, the strategy statement might be something like, we are going to highlight how course marking increases economic equity on campus through VIP events and media to convince Dean Nagel to prioritize course, course marking um, by lifting me up as a leader in this space. Now, what does that kind of speak to that y'all already picked up on on that like mini bio? What does that hit on? So you're lifting me up. Why does it matter to lift me up and make me feel good and like visible? Yeah. Exactly. You're doing me a favor because I want to progress forward in my career. And if I have all these news articles talking about how awesome I am, that's pretty great. But also, you're also speaking not just to my own, like, my own desires, but also the things that probably got me involved wanting to be a dean of technology to begin with, right? Talking about things like equity, talking about these students that might not be able to access their materials otherwise. People don't get into education because they're in it for the big bucks. People do it because they care. So it also speaks to that. And these are the things you're going to do to do that. Um, so, and what I mean by flows from the strategy, for example, how would a, your hero in this case feel if they got 50 personal letters from a student sharing their personal experience versus how would they feel if a thousand students sent them a petition being like, you better do this? Which one fits a hero strategy and which one doesn't? What? The first one definitely fits a hero strategy, yeah. And the second one is a pressure strategy. Okay, so these are like the three main pools for, for tactics that I like to think of. Visibility, does this build the visibility of this issue overall? Public support, we're gonna generate that broad swaths of the public are with us on this issue. An inside game, this is we're gonna play within the system, working with VIPs to, uh, to, to get this done. And I recommend combining some tactics from different groups. If you are just doing inside game, your victory can disappear like that as soon as the winds change because there's no public accountability. So you don't just wanna in the back room of a meeting be like, okay, you're gonna do this, great, great. And then you graduate and three years later, that thing doesn't happen. So you wanna build in something that builds community support. The other thing you wanna think of is um, how can you build your organization through tactics too, right? If you wanna have 40 volunteers on your textbook affordability campaign, which you can get, then you wanna make sure that there's something that all students will feel involved doing. Not all students are gonna to wanna to collect petitions. Some of them are gonna wanna be, be writers. Some of them are gonna design posters. Some of them are gonna to wanna to put on a suit and do a fancy meeting. So you wanna broad range of tactics to attract as many different types of student volunteers as possible to build your organization. You also wanna build your access and like your name with decision makers. That way you can get those meetings later. Because once you get textbook, once you get course marking, I'm guessing you're not done. You're not just gonna be like, okay, we fixed textbooks. You're gonna have to get more meetings. You're gonna have to build that access. Also think about how can you build your skills and how can you build the skills of your team? If you wanna do media work, the best way to make sure your team can do media work is to do it. So think about what you wanna get better at also when choosing tactics. And also, um, you wanna build your overall influence. So that way when someone's like, you know, we're doing this panel on textbook affordability, you know what we really need? I'm gonna get the student trustee because they had a meeting with me two weeks ago and I was really impressed by them. So let's bring them in on this. So build y'all's influence so people know what you're doing. Okay, great. So here's my common pitfalls and then I'm gonna answer some questions and then we're gonna go into the things, but I also wanna get a time check. When are we done? Uh, 4.30. 4.30, oh my gosh, we have so much time, great. Ugh. So here are my the most common pitfalls. One is lack of a specific or timely goal. This is the raising awareness problem. I'm going to say this again. Throw raising awareness into the sun. Great. Uh, another thing I see a lot is people starting with tactics. So they start with the thing that they wanna do. I wanna have a panel. 
Okay. Well, what are you trying to do with that panel? Does it fit into your overall strategy? Does, will, will, the, will the decision maker actually see that panel? If your goal is to get as many faculty to adopt an open textbook as possible, does having a student-facing panel actually help do that? If your goal is to increase student education around ZTC course marking, is having an educator-based panel going to do that? All of your strategy, all of your tactics have to flow south from your goal. The, last, the, the next one is escalating too quickly. Do not start by chaining yourself to the president's desk. There is nowhere to go from there. Um, your tactics, it, it is very easy to escalate up. It is very hard to de-escalate. And escalating can destroy relationships. And ultimately, you want to make sure that the relationships you have with your campus community can outlast whatever campaign you are working on. Um, which leads me to the, the overuse of pressure campaigns. And I'm someone, when I was a student, I, I was raising a ruckus, to be honest with you. I, uh, I definitely made life hard for a couple local state representatives in Athens, Georgia. Um, I don't regret that. But pressure campaigns, while they often are the first go-to, um, you should, one, make sure that your target if your target agrees with you, if they're like, I, I, you know what, I totally think that you're right, we don't have the funding. The solution might be to figure out where to find the funding and erase that cost, which is why you need to meet with that person first, figure out what's holding them back from doing the thing, and then work together to the solution. Because they might say, I really want to institute course marking, but I can't get faculty to send me their textbooks on time. Like, I just can't get them to do it. I've been trying to do this for years. Or they might say, we're having problems with this technology. So what you might need to do is figure out how you can spend your time removing those concerns from the decision maker so that way they can go ahead and do the thing they already want to do. Um, so it, don't overuse a pressure campaign. Save those for when you really need them. Because also, if you are always doing the pressure campaign, it can discredit people taking you seriously if you're always like, OK, because I know when I would go to the regents meeting in Georgia, the regents would be like, all right, here comes the students to come and yell at us some more. But they wouldn't actually listen to what we said, which is kind of on them, to be honest with you. But um, you want to make sure that you're using the campaign that best suits what you're doing. So I want to jump back up to lack of numerical tactical goals. You should put a numerical goal on every single thing you do. Every single thing. The number of volunteers that show up to this event. The number of faculty who come through and do this thing. The number of petitions that you want. The number of lobby visits that you're going to get on the Hill. The number of uh, media hits that you're going to get in the campus newspaper. Set a numerical goal, because that lets you plan how much time you need to spend doing that thing. And if you want to know how much time it takes to gather petitions, I, because I am an organizing nerd, have them all memorized, and you can ask me. For example, a skilled volunteer can collect 10 petitions in an hour. So if you have a goal of collecting 100 petitions, how many volunteer hours do you need? 10. Wrong. You need 20 because it's only a 50% show rate. Ah, sorry. I didn't mean to do that to you. I did, but I wanted to prove a point, right? Because it's not just how many hours does it take to do the thing? It's how, what is the percentage of people that show up to do the thing? And how do you plan and recruit for the number that it takes to do this? You need to have a volunteer goal, and it should, be it should include that show rate in addition to the petitioning goal rate, which means you should also record everything and write it down. So that way you can make your plans. So make plans. OK, so I'm going to pause. We're going to do a little bit of questions, and then I'm going to jump into some case studies so we can illustrate these points. So I have the question, I have the thing, uh, I can see chats in front of me, and I appreciate some of the folks doing uh, some direct messaging I see. Um, but what are some questions you all have? I can answer questions about textbook affordability. I would also love to answer questions about campaign planning. Um, so what do, what do you all want to know? Yeah, what's up? They don't always have to be like student manifestations. Like they can always like faculty could always bring like these different um, issues that ultimately need to be um, faced and like action taken towards them. It doesn't just have to be students. Like even faculty can look into each other. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, and I'm just repeating it for our friends, um, that it doesn't always have to be students against faculty or students against admin. They can work together towards a goal. That is absolutely true, and you should look for opportunities to do that. It can only be helpful because it's going to build those relationships that will let you win on campaigns further down the road, and it's just easier to do that. It's easier to do something with someone rather than pushing them. Um, so yes, absolutely. And there are lots of times you can work with administrators. For example, if your goal is to increase student education around course marking, your administrator probably wants more students to know about ZTC courses because it increases student uh, retention and increases student grade point average. So they might have resources that you can use. They might have ideas for the best way to do things. So it's not always an adversarial relationship and you should look for opportunities to build and collaborate with all the different aspects of your campus community. Um, great. Sorry, making sure there's no question. Okay, what other questions do we have? What, what campaigns are y'all working on? What are you trying to win? We're doing some Q&A now. Yeah, we're doing some Q&A, and then we're going to go to case studies. I see Cooper asking that. Y'all aren't working on any campaigns? My heart. The digital divide. Yeah. OK. I mean, it has, it has to do with this. I don't think I'm aware of all the things you mentioned before, but we're having troubles um, at our school. We're trying to coordinate campaigns uh, to uh, basically have services like majority of management tuition online, whatever, expense-based subscription services paid for, and also more accountability Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's like a method of deflecting blame onto their own uh, digital illiteracy. Yeah. Instead of actually dealing with the digital illiteracy, they're just handing it off so students can deal with this corporation that they're ultimately paying up the bills for. So we have a question from the in-room audience around um, automatic textbook billing, things like Cengage Unlimited, where how do we create accountability around these programs? Um, because oftentimes it's very easy to kind of pass the buck because it's an outside technology vendor that is responsible for these problems in a lot of ways. Um, I would say that one of the case studies I'm going to talk about is actually from University of Central Florida, where students were successfully able to uh, leverage their student power to get a opt-out program, so one where you have to figure out how not to pay for something, to one where you could choose to be part of that program and give you the option as a consumer to shop around and find the best option. So what I would recommend doing is rather than trying to like, you know, yell at faculty about this, because I don't think that that's actually gonna go anywhere. <laughs> and the faculty love it when you yell at them. Everyone loves to be yelled at. No, they don't, don't do that. Um, they, they, yeah, these services, these services are really popular. But I, what I would recommend is to try and put guardrails on your campus if possible and to set goals around that. Because if you do something that is like a one thing, right? Like a, our goal is to change this program to do X, Y, and Z thing. Then it's going to give you something to actually organize around, to recruit around, to have events around. Um, and also I would like, I would raise some, I, I, I think we should connect in person because I think that this is a really in-depth issue, yeah. and there's a lot of resources that I have on this, including some research. Yeah. 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 So there are people. So there are people in the trustees who want to do this, but sometimes you're you face like pressure on the ground, mm -hmm. and like I said, I'm repeating things, so I'm not. Um, yeah, so I, I would say that this is a really complicated question in a lot of ways, which is okay. Yeah. Um, but I think that this is something where you would want to actually spend some time 
digging into how are these contracts signed? Who has agency over these contracts? What is it that you actually want out of them? Do you just want them off campus or would you want there to be guardrails? Like ask the questions and then you might need to compromise based on like where faculty are at and where you can get them to. So, um, and then from there you can figure out who is it that actually controls this? What is it, you can do all of this with that in mind. And I can also connect you with some student leaders from other parts of the country that have been successful in pushing back on some of these publisher deals and either gotten amendments to them to make them better or gotten them removed from campus entirely. Okay. Um, so I can connect you directly with one of them. He graduated, but he was uh, a student government person at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, he's really great. And then um, students at University of Central Florida are still doing really great work and um, Florida International University has just launched a campaign. So I'd love to connect y'all to each other. Okay, so there's also a question, I'm gonna do one from online. Um, what campaigns can we work on, can we create one? Yes, you can create a campaign. Every single individual, whether you're doing it with the Student Senate or as an individual caring student, you can change the world in any way that you want to. You should just do it in a way that's like smart and wins. Um, I was not involved in student government. I was involved in a mass movement and got involved with local government uh, and local community groups. I never, when I was a student, I didn't get involved with student government. And I instead got involved with a local community group and we were mostly focused on issues within the town itself. So you as an individual and you within the student senate can design campaigns. And if you do it within the student senate, there's gonna be resources and guidance to help you do even further. So you can decide what it is you care about. Start with your vision narrow it down. And then there was another question on what's a good way to see if we've met an educational goal. I would say surveys are really great. I think we could do over, we overdo surveys in some ways, but if you are going to have an educational goal, you can say, I want, you know, 60% of students to know about this program. We're going to do a survey this year. And then in a year from now, we're going to do the survey again and see what's changed. So it can go, we want 60% of students to know where the food bank is on campus. Yeah, question there. Yeah. There's a question here about how we can get students to actually engage with surveys. I've run some massive surveys. I did two giant textbook survey reports where we surveyed around 9,000 students across the country on textbook affordability at about 100 institutions. Um, the ways that we did this is one, peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. Um, so you start out, you recruit 15 people. Recruit 15 people, they can be people involved with the Student Senate. You can call up people who said they wanted to get involved and say show up to this hour. And then you start out the hour by saying, everyone open up the contacts on your phone you're going to directly text 10 of your friends and ask them to do this right now that was one of our most successful things the next most successful thing was peer group social media so you want to break out of just the all-campus email send the all-campus email if you can do that because that's just you can do it in 15 minutes and you can get a lot of results but something like discord um, figure out where your students are on campus every campus has a different social media culture. Um, so for example, you, you, um, Rutgers University in New Jersey is a weird Twitter culture. Like the students there are all over Twitter. I don't understand it. Um, other campuses are Instagram. Your campus might like focus on Discord groups for specific classrooms or majors. You can also do class announcements um, where you can get up in front and just say, do this right now, it takes five minutes. Um, and I mean, like, reach out to faculty and say, can I make an announcement at the beginning of your class? 60% of them will say no, but that 40% that says yes, you can get a lot of traction out of that. So use diversity of tactics when you're trying to do student outreach on surveys. You can incentivize it. I've never found that to be particularly helpful. Um, and like, there are probably better things to use your resources on. But peer-to-peer -peer was the most successful for us. The one thing to be careful with that on, you wanna also make sure that you're collecting demographic data. And what I mean by that is not just the personal data about the students, but what year they are and what their course of study is. 
because if you have all chemistry majors sending out text messages, your answers are going to be really related to the chemistry department, and you want a full, uh, a full thing. Um, okay, I'm going to take another one for the chat. Uh, so, sorry, there is one. I'm having trouble scrolling because my mouse is going from thing to thing. Okay, so there's a question about corruption. I have to be honest, I didn't feel qualified to answer that one because I think that all these situations are very different. So I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. I would say that you as a student, I'm, I'm actually, um, I think student voice is a really great idea. I'm a lot more interested in student power and agency though. Um, and I think that you can get a lot done locally. So I would reach out to your local officials if you have concerns in something like that. And then, um, so someone was asking questions about providing support for undocumented students and dreamers. That's a great thing to hear that y'all are working on. I love to hear that. Um, wish that they would let you do surveys at your campus. I, well, I wish they would too. Um, so issues where you have administrators agreeing with the campaign and then uh, by state there's no funding. How should students proceed? So, if there, so sometimes people will say that there's no funding for something and what they mean is that there's no funding. Often what they mean is we are prioritizing our funding in different ways. So you should think about which one they actually mean. Because if it is because they have no funding, um, they're no longer the target. Your target should probably be your local uh, who provides the funding. Um, if they are just using the funding in ways, a different priority of funding, then they're still your target and you have to figure out how to make them prioritize it. Um, and then there was a question of like, uh, this one was sent direct, so I'll read it out loud. Were there a point in a campaign would you would have them switch to a hero campaign to a pressure campaign? And if so, how would you do that strategically to handle it? So in a situation like that, I'd imagine someone was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree, I totally agree. And you wanna err on the side of like, assuming they have the best intentions. And then um, somewhere down the line, you're like, you know what, this person's never gonna do this. I would do that by changing the tone of the tactics that you're using. So for example, rather than saying, we are so glad X, Y, and Z did this, it would be so much better if they did this, change the language. Um, in your letters to the editor, you know, it is go from, I am so happy I live in a district that does X, Y, and Z thing, you can change that to, it is ridiculous that we are in a place that does X, Y, and Z thing. Um, for example, we, when I was a student, um, one of the campaigns that I worked on was trying to prevent a Walmart from being built in the downtown. Um, that was something that I spent a lot of my last year of school working on, and that's because we knew that it would destroy 1.5 jobs for every one job it created. That was the stat we were working with at the time. And the city council said that they were with us, but they were definitely not. So we actually had to do that, and eventually they were able to stop that Walmart from being built. And it was because we had to change the tactics and the language that we were using. So you should always be adaptive, but always continue to assume the best of the person that you're working with. Okay, so I wanna make sure I get to some of these, um, to some of these case studies, because I do think that this is something you're seeing here. So at University of Central Florida, Florida was actually a really interesting state, which is why we're seeing a lot of automatic textbook billing pushback coming from here. They used to have a state law that required that all of these deals be opt-in, so that students would have to say, I'm okay with being part of that program. And then, um, eventually, they, there was a change in the law that allowed students to be, to these programs become opt-out, so you would have to figure out how not to be part of this program. When that change in the law happened, we started seeing the programs on the ground change as well, and UCF was one of them. There was a student group there, they're still there, they're really great, they're called Wiki Nights. They are, spend a lot of time working on issues around um, like developing the commons, uh, doing Wikipedia hackathons, working on open access issues. They teamed up with the Florida Student Perg chapter and um, they identify, so I'm gonna go through the main points. Their goal was we want to stop the opt out process at our campus for our, um, for our automatic billing program and make it an opt in pro program permanently. And to do this, we are going to convince our president to come out with a statement saying that they are going to do so. 
So they had a specific goal. Was it achievable? Was it yes, no? So it was measurable. They wanted to do it by the end of the school year because they were in contract negotiations at the time. So there was that tight window. They did some research. They knew that the president um, cared a lot about um, student pushback. So what they did was, and they also had a very politically charged campus. So this was, um, this started last year when there was a heightened political climate. And so one of their main strategies was to show that students from across the political spectrum, even if they couldn't agree on anything, agreed on this. So they built a coalition that included Young Americans for Liberty, the College Republicans, the Young Democratic Socialists of America, and the Campus Democratic Club. In addition to that, they also built out uh, ones with issue-based groups, um, subject-based groups, but the people really in the front of this were Wikinites and really highlighting the broad political support from across the spectrum that they had. And one of the things that you can really rely on when you're trying to create a hook for stories um, is something new, like new information, but another one is people that you would not expect to be working together, working together. That gets people to listen. And so they leaned into that hard. They um, collected thousands of petitions. They had a demonstration on campus. And um, before the end of the school year, the president put out a statement on the campus website saying that they were going to opt not to continue on with that opt-out program. Um, so you can see that they were aware of like what they had access to they didn't have the ability to do like a large flyering campaign or something like that. Instead, they focused on sign-ons. They had access to various political groups because one of the people involved was involved with student government. He didn't get involved in, through that aspect, but because of that, he had connections to all the different political groups on campus because they all interact with student government, particularly for debates. Um, and so he was able to leverage those connections for this campaign. Um, and then in addition to that, they did a lot of media work. There was a lot of campus opinion editorials and they built a lot of visibility, drawing a lot of attention to the campaign. So they were able to be successful through that. The next one is actually an ongoing campaign. So the University of California, y'all's neighbors, um, they ha are, uh, I don't need to tell y'all who they are, you live in this state, um, but while the California Community Colleges and the Cal State systems have been international leaders on open textbooks, the number of programs in the UC system has actually shrunk and not grown in the past 10 years um, for open textbooks. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity there, right? Because you have a unified system, they have one academic senate, and a little over three years ago, they came out with a statement in support of open access. And so I designed a campaign in my previous position as the textbooks director that was a hero campaign that said, we are so excited that y'all have come out with a statement in support of open access. If you extend that to open textbooks, it would cement you as leaders in this space. From there, I worked with um, particularly student leader at UCLA, Prabhdeep Rai, She's now a campus organizer. She just graduated. Now she's doing social change full time, which is awesome. Um, but she took on this campaign and really ran with it. They passed um, six student resolutions up across the UC. Um, they met with three of the UC regents. They got a UCSA resolution passed. They got hundreds of faculty to sign on in support of the campaign, um, and they got um, something like seven letters to the editor and earned news pe media pieces in the different campus papers. Now, in my time working on open, the UC hadn't really done a lot on open textbooks um, in like the, the five years that I had been working in that space. But after two years of students being very loud saying, you know, the California community colleges and the Cal States are doing this, why aren't we? I was a California community college student I had a zero textbook cost degree program. It's really ridiculous that we don't have one here. Shouldn't we have one here? Um, now the UCs move slower than molasses. That's just how large institutions go. Um, I don't wanna give people the illusion that social change happens overnight. Campaigns can and will take years. Um, 
but within the past year, they have um, started hearing, their UC regions have started hearing presentations and asking for presentations to learn more about open. Uh, we have seen a pan um, California open conference happen where UCs were involved for the first time in a lot of that spaces. Um, we've seen them asking a lot more questions. We've seen an expansion of open programs within the UC. So they're not done. They're continuing to work on this program. But this is an example of an ongoing campaign that students continue to work on and have been able to make progress on in just the past couple of years. Okay, so we have five minutes. I want to open the floor one more time, but I also want to give you all plenty of time to um, like write down my information if you want it. Um, so I'll answer questions, but if y'all have questions about open textbooks, if y'all want to um, learn more about these types of things, if you are someone who wants to be kept up to date on what's going on, feel free. Um, you can message me directly. That's my email. That's my Twitter account. You can check out the work that we're doing at 20 Million Minds. That's the website right there. Um, I do this work because I got involved in social change as a student. My last year of college, I got involved in a mass movement, and I had thought that I was going to spend my entire life digging holes and pulling old things out of them and writing reports and being an archaeologist. And then my last year of school, I saw that we could change the world. And once you realize, not only can you make the difference, but you get an idea for the type of world you want to live in, it makes it really hard to do anything else. So I love working with students because I know that y'all can win, and because I know the only reason that I got involved as a student was because someone asked me to. And that's really what organizing is. It's just asking people to do something and finding the people who are willing to do it and then continuing to ask them to make a difference. Organizing is a practice. It's something that has to be renewed constantly. It's not an end goal. We're never going to reach a perfect world. But we can spend our lives getting closer, and that's what organizing is. It's a continual practice that must be renewed. Um, so I will answer your questions, but uh, it is on the slides that will be shared, and it is the last one in there. I'll also, oh, thank you. Someone's putting my email in the chat. Thank you. Um, so in the last, like, three minutes, if y'all have questions, I would love to answer them. Um, I'm also very reachable if you have more in-depth questions that you want to talk about or you want to learn more about these programs that are going on on your campus, particularly around um, automatic textbook billing, something I've worked a lot on. Um, expanding open textbooks on your campus, expanding education around open textbooks, let me know. But do you all have any questions? Yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it's just it's, it's difficult to mobilize groups of kids. It's a bit of difference between the University of Central Florida. Yeah, so you're pointing out that there's a difference between like University of Central Florida, this large four year school, and the level of engagement you might see at a community college campus. Yeah. And I totally understand that, and you're not wrong. But we do have community colleges where the students are very involved in organizing, where we do have students that are doing things like getting 50 faculty to sign on in support of open textbook use. Um, like, I use these examples because I, I worked very intimately on both of those campaigns, but I am not saying that organizing is easy. In fact, I would say it's one of the hardest things you can do. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not worth it. And if you, if you want to talk a little bit about some of the things that I have done, like, later, to recruit students to events. I'll tell you the things that we did. I can help you make a plan. Like, it's gonna involve a lot of phone banking. <laughs> like, you're gonna spend like hours on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> that's, just, that's just how that goes. Yeah, I would, I, like social media, yeah, call people directly. 
and then call them again, and then call them again. They should block your number by the end of it. Um, okay, well, that's my time, but I wanna thank y'all so much for having me, and I am so excited that I got to be here with y'all.